just to start off, how many people here are here about current performance of the business, Perf making the business just perform better? Growing the business? Any growers? Right. What about valuation? Anyone chasing or more in lifestyle business? Running a business feeds the family, but it's really lifestyle. Lifestyle? Business to sell later on? Might be the guy next to you owns the business you want to sell later on. Okay, so we're going to cover a number of things today about performance, growth and building valuation in the business. And so on that, just with the person next to you, share like, what would you like to really get out of today? And if we haven't answered it as we go through, we'll take that as Q&A at the end, okay? So just a quick thing, what are you trying to get out of it? One minute with the person next to you, what are you trying to get out of today? One thing. <laughs> Can I, how far yeah, can I move? Um, I'll just follow you around, that's fine. Do it just preferably inside the signs, but if you want to move around and track the okay, trailer, Yeah, fine. okay. Because sometimes you've got to see what's up yeah, on the screen as well. Which is like... Yeah, no <laughs> no. Okay, we all got something? Everyone got at least one thing? Great. So what we what we see in the in this cycle of the perform the grow the valuation is um, businesses start up like a little mouse they scale up and then they sometimes stuff up later on. So what we like to do is focus on the ones that are scaling. Often the businesses that are tiny they've got to that stage where they've got a bit of a wriggle on but they just get stuck in a performance and growth type of challenge. You feel like this guy? You want to be like these guys. Right? We're dragging the anchor. We, we, we're trying to build and grow the business, but we're pulling a lot of weight. We want the wind behind us. In Australia, 2.1 million companies. Most of them stay under the, under the 5 million. It's about 15% get into the, you know, scale into that upper small medium business size uh, between 5 and 50, and only 1% crack 50 million. It's an interesting set of stats, isn't it? Because there's obviously something getting in the way. Otherwise, we'd all be driving bigger businesses. And here's some of the things that might be in the way. CPA Australia did a, uh, did a survey through 2016 uh, of our region. So there's, uh, there's eight countries in the survey, us, New Zealand, and nearby Asian neighbours. So what they did, uh, region, for those up the back, region in orange, Australia in blue. And so there's some interesting things you notice in terms of the trends that might impact what we're trying to do in performing and growing. So I just want to use this to set the scene for how we think about the performance of our business for FY18. So we've got many few of our, of our leaders under 39. Okay? They're, they're youthful economies. In particular, their expectations around economic growth are stronger than ours. And they, they're more likely to have grown last month, last year than we were. So the competition isn't necessarily the guy next door, it's the people who are driving business internationally. The average of all drivers of growth, so I looked at the drivers of growth being, um, are they seeking external funds? Are they increasing training within their business? Are they growing overseas revenue? Things like this. So, Things like increasing training, we were uh, 16 versus 37, right? so less than half. Overseas revenue, four. The question was, are we going to dramatically increase overseas revenue? Australia, four. 16. Growing e-commerce, no-brainer for most businesses. Uh, eight, 34, triple. Uh, are you going to introduce a new product, service or innovation? Four, 21. Five times more likely in nearby neighbours to be doing that than us. And uh, are you going to increase employees? We said 16, they said 39. Interesting. And so the average of all drivers 
uh, for us, it added up to nine, and, uh, and the region, 29, a little over triple. So in terms of setting the scene for the energy and the drive we have to go into driving our businesses and performing, I thought they were interesting stats to say, well, this is what's actually going on right now. And it might not be the guy in the, in the factory or the office next to us. It might be the young woman in the Philippines. It might be a family business in Vietnam. They're doing that. So question, what's in the way? And on your, on your um, seat there, you've got a set of 12 questions we're going to go through in the 75 minutes. And I know a lot of you have already read to the end. Right? But, um, so as you go through, you might want to just scratch a couple of notes. So, you know, as you think about the trends that were up there, what might be something, you know, what are we doing about training? What's happening with the ageing population? What's going on with the Internet of Things in my industry? A couple of things to think about. Number two there is, what's standing in the way? Do you know what this is? F-22 Raptor. So I went to the, uh, the air show with my son and, uh, and we talked to the Dice Men from uh, the Alaskan Raptor Squadron and uh, had a yarn them about the aeroplane. It is fearsome. It's invisible. It's a stealth fighter. Uh, it's uh, highly, uh, got, got a highly sophisticated weaponry system and it moves at 2410 kilometres an hour. So we said to the Dice Men, look, who's your natural competitor? And they smiled and said, look, actually no one. If you fight against us in net, you will lose. But it has a constraint. Do you know what the constraint is? This thing drinks a lot of gas. To go 3,000 kilometres, it needs 12 tonnes of aviation gas. 12 tonnes. That's with extra tanks, by the way. That's not with the normal tanks. Right? So you get weapons or tanks, you can choose. So, to travel any sort of distance, those guys need the Strato tanker. It flies at 850 kilometres an hour. So if you're the dice men, you're giving up 1,500 kilometres an hour of performance to keep up with the petrol tanker. That's their constraint. In the world's most advanced aeroplane. What's yours? What's yours? There's something in the way. So if you think about doubling the business, why haven't you done it already? There's something in the way. What is it? What is it? So to overcome some of these sort of constraints and to drive performance and growth, as Mark mentioned, I'm uh, certified as, uh, to do Gazelle's coaching as part of that international body. We think there are four main decisions that people, or sets of decisions that people have to make to drive the performance of their business. They're around people, strategy, execution, and cash. And this has been born out of intersecting with about 40,000 leaders around the world over the past 20 years, and it's been, uh, been refined to a bunch of principles that we think help drive performance in business. First, any accountants in the room, aside from me? Bit more enthusiastic, fellas. Come on. <laughs> okay, I'm recovering one. So let's talk about cash because everyone wants to know if you're accounting, you want to know where the money is. So the question is do you have sufficient cash to fuel growth? Because what we find is that as companies grow, they burn a lot of cash, and particularly in that um, two to five, two to seven and a half million, you end up like there's not a lot of business yet, but it's actually having to start paying out a lot of money to actually resource up, isn't it? So where do we find the money to do that? And here's something to think about. To do the growth, you require liquidity. The liquidity comes from profitability. So as you're thinking about the growth options, obviously got to be profitable growth options, don't they? And I think as businesses go on, often they get a bit stuck, they find this, they're, uh, they're doing some of the things which gradually become less profitable and deliver less cash into the business. So we take a leaf out of Usain's book. How are you going to pay for the goals? We've got some ambitions, maybe ambitions for next year, maybe things you're trying to get smashed in the next bit of time until this financial year ends. 
How are you going to pay for it? One of the exercises that we do is called the power of one, uh, that Alan Miltz is a well-known financial advisor. Alan asks people about the one percenters. Where are the ones going to come from in the business to free up some cash and liquidity, drive a bit more profit? Could you drive up price by 1%? Uh, this, uh, this exercise was done by uh, one chap. He just kept putting up his price until he got enough no's. His price went up 80%. He hadn't realised there was all that much, much difference. So he didn't do one. His price could be a lot different to what it was. Is there some extra volume somewhere that you could drive? What about cost of goods? Negotiating with suppliers? Rebates, discounts. Can you get your accounts receivable in a fraction earlier? Like that, like one day. What about payables one day later? You know, are you on terms or are you paying people too early? Inventory turns, an interesting one. Can you cycle the inventory through faster? Had a bunch of stock because of the, um, the high tech equipment they, they develop. <laughs> They had a lot of lazy inventory, a lot of lazy inventory. It's just sitting in the, in the factory. So not, not only was the money tied up in that, they had to have a factory that could store it. What about overheads? Is there some lazy money in overheads sitting around? Where is it? Where's the, where's the one percenters? The other thing I want to ask you is, um, Who's done the budget for next year yet? All, all sorted? No? Couple? I, um, in terms of what you're thinking about for next year, <coughs> how are you thinking about the money that's getting allocated to what you're thinking about next year? London Business School did a, uh, did a survey of leaders and the number they came up with was 11. That's the percentage of people who believed that their company had sufficient cash and resources and people allocated to their goals to make them successful. 11% thought their company had the right allocation to succeed on their goals. So as we sit here, my question to you, are you in the 11 or the 89? So as you think about the budget and where the money's going to go for next year, the 11 is a good thing to keep in mind, isn't it? Are we actually backing our ideas or are we still backing the old product, the old service, <coughs> things that maybe should be, uh, have the oxygen taken out? Does that make sense? Anyone worked in a business that's had stuff misallocated like that? I have. On the bottom of the second page, there is a, uh, a link there to templates. <coughs> so most of the templates that you see on the screen today are on that link called Tools and Templates. And they're all free. Okay, that's our sort of our gift to the leadership universe. Um, and so this is called the one page strategic plan. So some of the things that we go through today, if you click and download the fillable PDF, you can then populate things onto the one, uh, onto the one page plan. So help yourself to those resources. <clears throat> so moving on to the second decision with, uh, with people, I find this is the biggest, the, the biggest uh, uh, nut to crack for most businesses. Has anyone got people working in their business? All right, seems pretty universal. Um, and so uh, most of the leaders I talk to tell me that the problems they've got are largely on two legs. So let's spend a few minutes talking about, talking about people. <clears throat> Jim Collins um, has a great question and basically says, do we have the right people on our bus? Do we have the right people on our bus? Who 
Ever been this guy? So what do we do? What Tony does, you, you, do you understand, do you know the Zappos business? Started as a shoe, online shoe business. What Zappos does, um, Tony Shea who founded it, he actually, uh, at the end of induction, uh, he offers people a cheque to leave. It's a couple of thousand dollars, normally over there it's a month's pay to go. Because he wants to know really early on, if you don't want to be on the bus, that you'll take the, you'll take the cheque and you'll disappear. Because I think we've all had instances where we've had people working around us that them and us and everyone else in the business know shouldn't be there, and they're still there. So if, there's a, if they want to vote themselves off the island, Tony gives them a couple of grand, and it's sayonara. Okay? Something to think about. So this will be illegible on, on uh, this from the, from the back. <coughs> but... What you want to think about is uh, how many A players you've got in the business. So this is uh, question number five. So an A player, so on, on, this, on this axis, axis here is productivity and capability, and on the vertical axis is core values, values alignment. So what we're trying to do is find that uh, nexus of people who we want in the business because they're the right side of belief system, spirit, but we, we want them here. They're a nice person to have here. And on the horizontal axis, it's about capability. Are they actually making a dent here? Are they, are they actually productive and capable and useful? Or are they just a nice hopeless person? Okay. So what we're after is more A players. So an A player is somebody who can do uh, ninety percent of what only the top ten percent of people like them can do. So, if you've got a EA and you're in the, in the suburbs, are they can they do ninety percent of what a top ten percent of EAs can do like them? If they're a marketing guy, same. If they're a salesperson, is this salesperson a top salesperson? Can they do most of what we need out of this, this sort of role? And if I think about doubling my business. Could this person be playing in the team that doubles my business? Can they play in that grand final? You know how AFL teams sort out? We reckon we'll be able to play a grand final in a couple of years. Who'd be on the team that does that? A's. B players are capable, and I talked to Brad Smart about this in the US a couple of years ago. He was the advisor to Jack Welsh as they grew GE and grew its leadership capability. He said B players are only B players if they can become A players within one to two years with coaching support and so on. Okay. <clears throat> a different view. I think there are Bs who you like having in the business and they're good performers. They're not, they don't need or want to be stars, but you need them in the business and they're driving, you're driving results, but they're, they're not necessarily going to take off. That's okay. C players, low values alignment, low capability and productivity. Do you know what should happen with them? They need to move on and be released to the economy. Uh, Ds, the CD, the bottom right hand corner, often high performers, but nigglers. So if you, you spot these people, if you're in a meeting and then straight afterwards they're at the, at the water cooler having a different conversation to the one that was had in the meeting, they're not really values aligned, bit of a lone ranger. Anyone ever had someone like that around them? Yep, most of us, you know the people. So basically there's a conversation with them if your values are clear uh, around being part of this organisation or what it means to be part of the organisation, otherwise they may just be a C in hiding. So what we're really after here is the top line. And the way I get clients to do it is basically work towards 75% A's, 75 to 80% A's, 20 to 25% B's. So people are either already there or trying to be there. <coughs> so recent example, um, in the footy, Hawthorne a couple of years ago won a premiership. Six of those players have now moved on, they're top players, the A's. 
retired, traded and so on, and they are now near the bottom. So as you think about the ratio of A's and non-A's in your business, think about that example, and in most businesses it's not obvious week to week like it is in sport, is it? We don't actually know how we're going against how we could be going. These guys get it shown up each week. And so it's a pretty stark example, isn't it, of what happens if you don't have that mix right. So with your business, how are you going A's and B's and C's? These. I normally find, by the way, that there's it's kind of five percent down down here. <clears throat> One client I did this exercise with, they had uh, 32 staff, and they had their leadership team there. And I said, "Look, do the uh, do the A player exercise." And they were fiddling with it, and they said, "Look, we don't really know who to go where." I said, "Okay, I'll make it easier. I've got a bus with the engine running outside the door. I'm starting a competing business just down the road this afternoon. Who gets on the bus?" So they started, started writing it down. Out of the 32, the same four people appeared in the bottom left-hand corner for everybody. So over the next couple of months, those people um, were helped to find different opportunities. And the, the CEO said to me, I can't believe the difference this has made in my business. Four people lighter, about 300 grand extra to the bottom line because he wasn't paying them. And he said the lift in the staff was unbelievable. I said, do you know why? Because everybody else knew who they were too. And no one had done anything about it in the leadership team. So think about that one for a sec. How's the ratio look right now? And the other thing is, as you scale, who is an A changes, doesn't it? because the A player financial person you need might be different, you know, it's different in a $2 million business to a $100 million business. I talked with one guy and his, um, uh, his family had grown their business from two or three million to 90, and his financial guy was a bookkeeper who was his mate from school. You know, he really needed a CFO by then. So, who you need as your A changes. So be particularly aware of the C's and, and think about how they might move out, have that, have that direct or coaching conversation, or if it becomes a performance, you know, get the right advice, but it becomes a performance conversation eventually, doesn't it? Um, and provide the coaching. I mean, these guys are the coachables, the B's. Who, who are the up and comers? And so let's stop in terms of um, performing better next year, let's stop this idea that everybody gets equal training and development and stuff, that's, that's ridiculous. We grow the people that need and should be grown. There's some people who need to leave. There's some people that need to uh, get questioned about where they are. And that's the, that's the B's and C's. These B's, B's players down here. So if you've got the right sort of people in the business, if you get left with that group who should be there, are they actually in the right seats? Do we know what the right seats are? And are those people who are in the right seats doing the right things? So this will be an ant sized print, but again, this is a downloadable. And what it is, it's just a, a standard form that basically says, here are all the functional roles, and you can add, add your own, but here's some key functional roles. Who is the person accountable for th that role? And when we say accountable, does everyone understand what the accountable thing is different to being responsible for it? When we ask how that function is going, held to account. And so, uh, one of my clients in sales, when we got to this question, I said, who's accountable for sales? And he said, well, me, I'm the CEO, and, uh, and, and this other guy, he's the head of operations, and we've got the, um, the guy who runs the West Coast and the East Coast. I said, yeah, who's in charge of, who's, who's accountable for it? And he said, those four guys. I said, no, no, when we come back next time we talk about this, who is the one person who tells me about sales? There was no one person. 
So until you actually work out who the, who the, um, the, the single human being is that's accountable for the function, it's very hard to drive performance because everybody's accountable. Correct. So if everyone is, no one is. So we put down the person accountable and the way I recommend doing it is on the first cut, you put everybody who you think it is. And it might be the three or four people in a single role. And put them all down. <clears throat> and then look around and say, look, have we got more than one person in a seat like those guys did? Have we got one person in more than one seat, multiple hats? Often, in, in, particularly in smaller businesses, anyone here wearing more than one hat on that list? Yep, most of us. Are there some empty seats? Are there some things that are not being done at all? So I had some things around marketing that weren't being done at all, so I've outsourced that. Social media, I get done, so I don't have to do it myself. So I thought there were roles that have to be done I don't either want to do or can do. Are all the people in those roles, going back to the previous conversation, if you've got a bigger business, are all the people ones you'd enthusiastically rehire? And then as you think about the people in the list and their, their own strengths and capabilities, are they the right person in that seat? You might actually find, oh, the one who's doing ops should really be doing sales and the other way around. You know, there's diagnostics and things you can do to help tease out what are people's actual strengths. You might have some misfits. They might be the right people in the business, they're just in the wrong job. And a way to find that out is, you develop some key performance indicators for the role. And the best way to do it is you cover up all the names. And say for this function, not for this person, oh, we know Daryl won't be able to hit that sales target. Yeah, let's just make it a bit smaller. No, no, what's the indicator for the role? Okay, that brings a bit more rigor to it. And then for that role, what's the profit and loss or balance sheet implication of the role? So you start to build a bit more structure around it. And then when you're hunting for another person as you grow the business, you can say, well, here's, here's the indicators, here's what we measure it against. Can you show me where you've achieved these sort of results before? So on the, on the um, website there's that and there's also a process accountability one. So if you think about functions, you can also think about the processes. Which a lot of people think, think much more about organisation charts and pyramids and all that sort of thing. They think less about what's the, um, what are the processes that we're trying to run and who owns the process. Um, values in the business. How many people have got values written down for their business? About half. Great. <clears throat> so values, the handful of rules um, that you use to run the business. And these stay constant over time. So one of the things I try and drive through into the client, uh, into my clients is let's get the belief system sorted out for the business. So if we understand what we believe as a business, what's our values, what's our purpose, wh where are we trying to take this, it's then a bit more easy to develop a strategy that's consistent, isn't it? So some tests of your values. If someone offended the values, would they get fired? Or are they kind of the values that, you know, someone's come and done a two hour session and they've been etched in glass somewhere and stuck on the receptionist desk at the front and no one really pays attention to them anymore. Would you take a financial hit for adhering to your values? And most importantly, are they actually alive amongst the people in the organisation now, or are they aspirational? Because it's very easy to go through and say, oh, we'd love integrity. Yeah, you, you, you'd love it, that'd be great, but, um, but do you have it? Do you actually believe in that? And is that actually just really a generic value anyway, by the way? It's not distinctive, is it? So are they alive amongst the people today? And one of the ways that we do this is to say, if someone was to come to your, to come to your business from Mars, by observing the employees, could they tell you what your values are? Without reading them anywhere. 
by the behaviours that they see. So, a couple of a couple of local examples that I like. I like the um, I like the ones that Vocus have got, and I like the ones that Atlassian have got. If you've seen the um, uh, if you've seen the Atlassian ones, you can look those up on the web. Well, these ones, and they, there's just, and you normally want three to five, right? So Vocus have got four, and they use, you notice they use company type language. They're not using normal sort of um, words here. Clever company, no Muppets. And what we mean by that is we're awesome people with a great attitude, unleashed and empowered to do our job. Have a crack. We detest bureaucracy. We collaborate to find a smarter way. We take risks. We act decisively. We celebrate our wins. When you're interviewing for people to come and join you, if you've got a list like that, you can actually interview against that, can't you? You can ask people, can you tell me about a time when in your previous role, you had to act decisively, show leadership, take risks. Don't screw the customer. They don't say we're having integrity, they say don't screw the customer. We put ourselves in the customer's shoes. We make it easy to buy and easy to use. So when you're coming up with an initiative for next year about a product or service you bring in, you can test it. Is this making it easier for our customers to buy or use? Are we being congruent with what we said? And the last one. <laughs> uh, we respect each other. We value relationships and we have the hard conversations. They don't want clowns working in their business. Again, you can interview against that, can't you? You can't ask someone if they're a dickhead, but directly, but you can test the behaviours. So what I suggest is, as you look at and reflect on the values you've got now, what are the three to five that best represent what you're about? And what are the behaviours that go with those? So they've got the value, but they've got the, the sort of the behavioural things that they expect to see as well. So just having the value up there, integrity, it, it, it doesn't work. You need to do that. So then when you're holding people to account, remember in the previous slide I was talking about the, the, um, the ABC players, we said the low values alignment. You can actually then have a conversation with people and say, here are the areas, here are the behaviours, can you show me how you're actually do, doing these things. It's a bit harder to say to someone, I don't think you've lived up to our integrity value. Is it? So it needs a bit more richness like this. So, <coughs> flip the page. Third decision is on strategy. So can you state your strategy simply? It's not about the big book. Michael Porter is a pretty famous uh, strategy guru. And his point is it's about this unique and valuable position, differentiated from competitors. Unique, valuable, differentiated. So really what you're trying to do is say, well, how do we craft that? How do we craft that? So the way I like to do it is to think about it from two angles. The first is core competencies. What are those three to five things that the business is really good at? Really good at. And those, those things underpin our success. So normally the things we're good at are some combination of the processes, systems and activities that we've built into the business. They might seem simple from the outside. And you say you look at a McDonald's, and it's a simple like a burger, but they've had a logistics process to get all, the, all that thing, globally sourced things. They've had a training program that can get kids who won't make their own bed to run a store. Right? So there's all that sort of side that comes behind compilation of processes. So Nordstrom, anyone been to Nordstrom store? Okay, they're well known for their customer service. So, but you can't just hire Christina and get Nordstrom service. She's part of it, 
because she's been trained by them, she's been recruited because she fits their model and their values, there's techno technology systems and so on that enable that service. So if you want to return a piece of clothing, you just go back, you give them your mobile phone number and they say, thanks very much, here's your docket and see you next time. Because they've enabled it and they've created the policies that support her doing that. So they seem simple. You think, oh, why don't I just go and poach her? She was lovely. Well, there's a whole lot of things behind that that make it possible for her to be that good. Combination of things, competencies. So just think about that, if, you, if, you, if I was asking about your business, what would be the three to five things that you're just awesome at? What are those couple of things that are really quite powerful that your organisation does? Is it the analytics you do in the piece of work that's quite distinctive? Is it the way you deliver? Is it the speed you're able to get things done because of the process of the people you got involved? What are the key things? If you were telling a seller, what would you tell them were the really great things about the business that are the real guts of what makes it work well. What are those three to five things that really make it a tremendous competency for you? And if you don't know what it is, it's a good task to find out what it is. <clears throat> the other part of this, in terms of triangulating where your, your strategy comes to, is your brand promise. What are you promising the customer? Here's what we're good at, here's what the customer wants. What are the usually three things, a leading promise and a couple of supporting promises, that you make to your customers, either overtly or, or more subconsciously? Here's the way these guys do it. Southwest Airlines, their lead promise is low fares. Mostly people go to them because they've got low fares. Right? But they also promise fun and lots of flights. And it's the combination of the three LFs, the low fares, the lots of fun, lots of flights, they're actually hard to replicate. So Ryanair would say they've got low fares and lots of flights. Most people wouldn't argue they're fun. These guys do the, do the three things. And by the way, in that combination, it's harder to get a job in any role at Southwest than to get into Harvard. Okay? So that's their three. What are yours? What, what are you promising the customer? Or what do they think you're promising them? And a trick to thinking about it is, um, to unpick it a bit, I normally get clients to say, look, is there a time one, a quality one, and a cost one? So if you think about this, in their case, they've got cost in the fares, they've got time in the flights, and they've got quality in the fun, okay? So there's a way of thinking about, oh, is ours really a cost business? Then it might be a fares. Is ours really a quality thing? We're quite distinctive in the product we develop, and or it's a premium product. Or is there something you're doing with time? You're saving time for clients somehow. And the way this comes together, there's a great book, by the way, called Uncommon Service by Francis Fry and Anne Morris that this comes from. And this goes back a bit to the cash discussion we had at the start. What are the most important things to the target market down to least important things. And so Commerce Bank asked this question because they were trying to crack into the market. And what they found was that um, a lot of bank customers actually wanted uh, more convenience. They wanted things like Saturday morning bank opening. And they wanted a different level of customer interaction. They found it was all a bit staid in the banks they were at. I don't know whether you've ever had that experience, but some people do. And, and so they, they wanted um, a more engaging um, banking experience. What they also found, though, was that they had to pay for that somehow. Remember, I talked right at the start of the, of the, the discussion about where's the money coming from? How do you liberate the cash? They liberated the cash by having a very tiny product range. Single checking account, single deposit account, 
the deposit account pays zero interest. That was, for those customers who wanted the convenience and the service, the product range wasn't relevant to them. They didn't really care about that. And, and again, with the price, they paid nothing for deposits. They were tiny. And so Fry and Morris basically said, don't be just average on some of these things that aren't important to the customer. Be terrible. Because do you know where on this graph, do you know where most companies end up? Where do they end up? Yeah. Average at everything. They won't put the effort in to be outstanding on a couple of dimensions and they won't have the guts to be terrible on a couple of dimensions. So finding out the things that are important and relatively important, the customer obviously would love everything. We'd love all of that to be awesome. Sorry. Right? So what are the things, and you have to do this in, ask the questions in pairs, is convenience more important to you or price? That sort of thing. Because if you ask, oh, what would you like, they'll tick 10 out of 10 for everything. So it's, what's the preference, A or B? C or D? A or D? That sort of thing. Have the conversation. And what they found is the relative performance of the firm with their competencies, they said, well, we just become really good at convenience, open Saturday mornings, and in customer interactions, Commerce Bank hired ex-cheerleaders. <laughs> bubbly front of house people engaging for the customer and in terms of the way they set up their business it's a tiny product range so there weren't 500 products that you needed a really complex banking qualified people to understand nope do you want a check account yes or no deposit account yes or no we only have one okay so that's how they made the business model work spreading it out So that's how you drive up. So in your strategic choices, in the three to five things that you want to think about, how could you do something like that? Blending the things that you're good at or need to become good at and the things that are important to the customer in terms of what you're promising them. And then have the courage to say, you know what, these few things aren't that important. Let's invest less of our money into that and put the cash that we have got, drive it into the things that are important to customers and we're different. Make sense? Yep. So, how many bosses here, by the way? Right. Um, the 95 is the bosses. That's the bosses who thought everyone was committed to their strategy right. and going to deliver it. Uh, the 80 is the percentage of people reporting to them that didn't know what the strategy was. <laughs> Bit of a delta, isn't it? So we sit there in our boss chair thinking, I've got this in my brain and I'm sure we had one conversation about it. I'm sure the team are doing this. 80% of the people directly reporting to you do not know what the strategy is. They do not know. And so it's not really possible that if you've got another layer under that, that they'll have any better view, is it? Correct? And so in terms of performance, <coughs> one of the key things to do is to get that alignment fixed up, isn't it? Yeah. That what you're trying to get done is really clear and aligned. And what we say to people is, get this line of sight going. Have your really, really long-term goal. Have a three-year plan. And normally the three or five, by the way, is the time you want to double a business. So if you want to double in three years, three-year plan. Annual plan, and the annual plan will have a sing the single steps out of three years. So if you have a three-year plan with five things on it, here's the key things that are going to double our business in the next three years. What's the one-year version of each of those? We've got to have an online platform established. Right, one year, what, how far is that going to get? We've got to have a geographic presence in this, this and this country. Great. In year one, how far is that going to get? And so in terms of communication, it's easier, isn't it, for the people down the line. They say, oh, that's right, we remember this three-year thing and here's what we're doing towards it in the first year. Whereas mostly we have either no plan or a wafty plan and then, oh, we're doing this today. Did you not talk about doing this yesterday? And so you end up with dispersed effort, don't you? 
and then drive the annual plan right down to quarterly. Okay, so what, what's going to happen out of this annual plan? What needs to get done the next 90 days? And in, with my clients, I say, what's going to be done the next 90 days by you and you and you and you? Cross-committed around the table. And in terms of performance, they get 75% of their most important stuff done each quarter. Because it's aligned, it's clear, and they're across accountable. Does it make sense how that would work? Yeah? So the last one is, uh, is execution. So it's all good, but you've actually got to do things. So is the flywheel in the business, is it running without drama? Able to zoom around like those blokes without bumping into each other. And the three things we like to do in, in execution sense is we say, have you got those priorities sorted out? Normally three to five for each of the main time frames. Have you got metrics and data that tells you how that's going? So looking out the windscreen, how's our funnel looking of sales, those sorts of things. Looking in the rear vision mirror, how did we go with sales? How are we going with our net promoter scores, things like that. Uh, and meeting rhythms, so what's the cycle of connecting with people and meeting that's actually going to help you drive these better, faster decisions? So today we'll just talk about the priorities one. So the Pareto thing's pretty well known. The 80-20 rule. So you've got to weight your efforts towards those handful of things that are going to make the biggest difference. And so I say to all the people, what are the three to five things, and I, and I get them, and a way to do this, you say for next quarter we've got to do all these things, and just write the omnibus list down, here's all the stuff we've got to get done. And then say, right, out of that, what are the most important three to five, what can we not avoid doing? And then you can also work from the bottom and say, look, with these things, does it matter if we do them this quarter, next quarter, or never, and just cross them out. And you end up coming to a much easier list of the important things. And what it then enables you to do is have those conversations about what are the most important things. I've got 10 on my list. And I had this in a, in a team um, recently. And the HR director had 10 things on a list. I said, look, was there something confusing about the three to five idea? And she said, look, all this stuff's got to be done. And I said, okay, team, she reckons all this stuff's got to be done. What can we let go? And there was a piece of the, of the work and they said, look, honestly, we haven't, there were things like um, uh, the staff bonus system and so on. We'd promised people that was going to be in for the 1st of July. I said, great, keep that. But there are other things that were on the list that really were much less relevant for the current quarter. And they agreed as a group that they could get pushed aside. So she got left with her three to five. Agreed, committed, accountable. But it's from refining the list. And you have that, you have that conversation amongst the one, two, three, four, or five people that run the business, you just say, you can even do this exercise by yourself, right? It's what I do for my own business. Priorities. So work out what are the three most things. So as you think for next year, to deliver the number that you'd like to get to, what are the five things that you really got to get done? What are we really great at? What's the customer expect? What are the things that are going to most shift the needle in terms of driving those, those results for next year? Uh, and this is completely legible and it is downloadable off the, uh, off the uh, website. And it's called the Rockefeller Habits. And so old man Rockefeller <coughs> created these habits about 100 years ago. And they've been, um, they've been pulled out to help us with our execution. And so it's a list of 40 things, 10 different categories. And so when you download this sheet off the, uh, off the site, the first three are the ones to focus on if you don't already do them, okay, in terms of the habits to, to drive better execution. And the first three are about the executive team being healthy and aligned. And so that's people understanding each other's differences and priorities, team meeting frequently, so we, we normally say that team meeting weekly. 
team participating in ongoing executive education, so they're growing and they have these constructive debates. So check those off. Are we doing those things or are we not doing them? So if, if you're not already doing them, that's something to work on in the first quarter. A topic I've just been talking about, everyone aligned with the number one thing. What's the most important thing we're trying to get done in the business? Do we have a critical number behind that? For one of my clients in, in Allied Health, um, they were selling an incredible amount. Sales wasn't their problem. Recruiting the people, the Allied Health professionals, to do the work they'd won. That was the problem. So that was the key number they measured. How are we going recruiting the people to do the work? Okay, so, you, so it's like looking in a car, you're looking at the dashboard, how's this thing running? And the third thing is around communication rhythm. So how are we going with employees in a daily huddle so that everyone st sticks, is clear and gets aligned on what you're doing? All those teams, if you've got teams working with you, have weekly meetings, that sort of thing. So download the Rock of LA Abbott's checklist off the, uh, off the website. You can tick that off. And so here's where some of these things we've talked about today fit in. We've talked about values. We've talked about your competencies. We've talked about the brand promises that you're making to clients. This idea of getting some key initiatives going for the year and the quarter. And again, that one is downloadable. You can start to populate it out uh, when you're back in your office. So just to wrap up this session today, as you think about what we've talked about, what's the front domino? What's the thing you need to tap that is going to tap the most other dominoes? The one thing that's going to make the most difference. So it'd be worth scribbling a note down about that. What's the, what's the one thing that you've picked up that might make the most difference in your business? And so um, the last thing I'd like to do is say on the bottom of the form, uh, you'll notice gifts to attendees. There's the templates are on the website there. Um, I've also uh, offered, there's a value builder score. So if a number of you said you'd like to build the value of your business. Um, if you go onto that link, there's a 13 to 15 minute questionnaire that will tell you what the score is for your business. Most businesses, so you don't get a fright, score between 50 and 60. That doesn't mean a bare pass in this analytic. But high performing businesses get 80 or above and their valuation is 71% better. 71% better. So it's actually worth knowing what the score is and a few tips on what to, what to uh, do to drive better performance to get a greater score, isn't it? So we can get that out to you if you fill that in. And the, the third thing is I, uh, I do a, an insights column every two weeks and some of these sorts of questions and things come out through that. Um, anyone want to, interested in uh, being on an insights list, getting that sort of leadership bunch? Yep. Most? Okay. Right, we'll get that sorted out. Okay, thank you very much, and I uh, hope you got a few tips out of that, and I think we're going to do some Q&A if that, if that helps. So thanks very much, Rob. Uh, open you guys for any questions. Uh, there's always a couple. Done silence. It's been that good. Well, well, based on the question you had at the start, have we answered the question or the thing that you hoped you'd get out of it? If we have, mission accomplished. How was that? <laughs> so, sure. Sure. So, what's the um, important factors for leadership um, for the leaders who have not much leadership experience? Yep. The easiest thing I find for leaders without much leadership experience is to, is to get the structures going so that they build the credibility with their team so that the team gets this sense of we know where this organisation's going. Um, and so people don't like, the, the main attractor for people is they like working with a purposeful organisation where they can use their strengths, where they get the support of their leader and they like the people they're working with. And so if you can tick off some of those, so we've given this morning some tips on how to be clear about the direction of the organisation and weeding out some of the people who shouldn't be there. The next step um, is that I, I um, encourage people to become a leader as a coach rather than a leader as a boss. So 
those one-page uh, plan documents, I like to drive down the organisation so that the people working with you have their own plan. So you might have your own three to five things you're doing, they'll have their three to five. And then the way you lead them is by saying, how are you going with your three to five? Where are you stuck? What help do you need? What are your options for moving that forward? What are you going to do next? And so it makes it more of a constructive, collaborative discussion rather than the, rather than the boss type discussion. And people particularly who've come out of um, functional technical type of roles have found it easier to be a leader that way than just trying to be the boss because they can have those sort of conversations. Does that help? Sorry, there's someone over here. Yep. I was just going to ask whether you think um, when your company values, do you think that should be reserved just for your internal uh, stakeholders, or should they have a place in your, in your marketing and stuff like that as well? Yeah, I, I, I think being out there like those guys are. I mean, the Vocus ones, the Atlassian ones I talked about, they're all out in, they're all out in the public forum. And in fact, Atlassians are on their recruiting page. And they basically say, if this sounds like you, uh, get in touch. Um, and, and so, and in a sense, you know, also being held to account by customers for what the, what the values are isn't a bad thing. So, um, and if they're out in public, people will either see some of those things like for Vocus and say, yeah, I don't know that I want to be held to account. I don't know that I like difficult conversations. That might not be for me. Correct. Yeah. So it's a, it works as a useful filter, I think. Yeah. So just it just reminded me of a, of a colleague of mine um, when I was financial planning uh, before I retired for the third time. Yeah. Uh, he actually created a board of some of his people and some of his customers yep. Yep. and produced phenomenal uh, feedback but kept them very accountable because yep. the customers would, would tell them, hey, you were drifting off. Yep. Worth thinking about. Yep. Yeah, and so one of the things that we suggest to people is, um, is particularly with multi-year goals, an advisory board type idea can be, can be useful because you bring in people who don't have the skill. So if you've got skills internally, but you're trying to do something new, you might be trying to launch in China or you might be um, uh, driving an online solution or whatever. If your current business doesn't have that capability, that's a great opportunity to bring in external advisory board members to top up the capability you've got within the business. Absolutely. Sorry? They're free. Can be, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. One last question for me. Hmm. Um, a, a lot of what you talked about is the accountability piece. Yep. And to stay accountable, uh, there's got to be another process beyond that. And you often talk about a huddle. Yep. Um, what do you define as a huddle and how often should we have a, a huddle, so to speak. Right, so, so daily huddles are 12 to 15 minutes and it's really just a, um, uh, a touch base or a catch up. I mean, so often in, our, in, in busy sort of um, lives we'd find that there's people trying to get you on the phone, they're trying to email you, they're trying to stick their head in your office and there just aren't those opportunities in the day or you're getting con constantly interrupted. So the huddle provides a moment in time each day where the team is together and normally cascaded down if they're bigger organisations with their own sub teams, where they have that, that, um, that few minutes of being together. How are we going? Where are we stuck? What are our wins? What's happening today? Oh, someone's sick. We've, we've just won this big contract. Uh, there's something gone wrong with this delivery from overseas. It's not going to be here till tomorrow. It's all these sort of things that everyone in that group needs to know, but it saves countless interruptions. So it's just a little check-in. It's less about accountability on that, on that sense. The accountability one normally, if you're, say, setting the quarterly goals with people, so um, say you're cascading your 90-day goals down to your team, then it would be you having a cup of coffee with those people a couple of times during the quarter to say, how are you going with your personal set of these? So that accountability is more a one-to-one -one coaching conversation. The, the huddles are more just a cascade of one of the meetings that says operationally what's going on right now in the business. Yeah. Any other questions?
Hold on, old solid old thing. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Rob Nankers for being here.